Okay, so um, my name is Colin Levette Brown. I'm from the University of Victoria, which is right across the water from where the next OpenStack Summit is. And, uh, but we have much better weather than Vancouver does, so uh, we'll feel sorry for you when you arrive. Anyway, I'm going to be talking about Glint, an image distribution service for uh, multi-stack, uh, multi-cloud environments. Okay, so here's the uh, overview of my talk. I'm going to be talking about who we are and what we do. I'm going to talk about why we did Glint in the first place. Then I'm going to tell you all about Glint. And there's a one uh, per slide summary. So first of all, we are a high energy physics research group at the University of Victoria. We particularly support uh, networking and uh, compute solutions for high energy physics at the university. But we also support other disciplines uh, that use high throughput computing. And specifically, we support the astronomers who are also at the university there. Um, we've been actively working on clouds and virtualization since 2006, so we've had quite a, a few years of doing this now. Uh, the picture you see is actually uh, um, a particle trace from the discovery of the Higgs boson, I'm reliably told. So, okay. so our primary interests are in the ATLAS experiment in uh, uh, Geneva and also the Bell 2 experiment that's based in Japan. And there's a definition there with, uh, about what high energy physics is, which is basically uh, the study of the fundamental particles that make up our universe and the interactions that they have. Okay, these are pictures of the Large Hadron Collider, which is in Geneva, uh, Switzerland. Um, at the top of the circle, you can see the airport and Lake Geneva. This is a 27 uh, kilometer circle, circumference circle. Um, and this is the Atlas detector under construction. And as you can see in the well of the detector there, there's a man standing, which gives you some idea of the size of the detector. Uh, the next picture is of the Bell 2 detector, which is under construction. This detector is going to be coming online in about 2016. But in the meantime, there's a, quite a bit of preparatory work in order to, uh, to do the analysis of the data that will come off this. So these, uh, these experiments are uh, uh, many decades in preparation. There's uh, lots of work and cost in producing these things. They produce huge amounts of data. I think the, the Atlas data set is currently 200 petabytes. I think it's very large. Um, uh, and so there's, there's a lot of processing. And here we have the processing that's been done this year on the distributed cloud model. It uh, actually shows you that we've done 1.2 million jobs. Each one of these jobs is uh, um, you know, about 12 hours long, okay? and they run about 95% efficient. So the wall time and the CPU time are pretty much the same time, actually. Um, so yes, it's 1.2 million jobs. Uh, in the case of Bell 2, his, we just started the processing here. Uh, with, this is 30 days of uh, processing. This is the worldwide uh, processing that's been done in the 30 days from uh, the first week in September through October. And um, basically, it shows you all the sites in the world that are doing it. So the first two are the, uh, the one in Germany. It's a hardware site. It's not a, a cloud site. The second one is in uh, the, uh, the, the home of the experiment. is in Keck in Japan. And that's a hardware site. But the third one is actually the UVIC site. And uh, it is the cloud site. And you can see that we're the third producer in the world uh, right now on that, uh, on that site. Um, I see, we are running currently about 12,000 jobs a day for, for, for Bell 2 processing. Okay, so uh, this map shows you roughly where our clouds are, and the main thing I want to point out here is that we're actually processing on three continents here, and we are using about 25 clouds. And uh, we have to uh, um, synchronize the images between those. So uh, what is high throughput computing? Very simply, high throughput computing is a batch processing uh, uh, scenario where a user submits a job to a job queue, and the job scheduler runs it on the available resource. It's that simple. Um, so we have this high throughput computing model. Uh, the problem is we only have very small amount of resources at the university, and we need to use other people's resources to make that up. So uh, we actually use anybody's resources who wants to donate them to us. We'll, we'll make use of those, uh, as long as we, uh, they're of the cloud variety. And uh, because these resources don't belong to us, and because they're kind of dynamic in nature, especially when we create VMs on them, we need a job scheduler that can actually handle uh, dynamic resources like that. Uh, the next thing we need is a way of automatically starting 
uh, virtual machines on the clouds because we don't want to be doing that manually. So we've written a piece of software called Cloud Scheduler, and it, uh, it manages uh, the, uh, the instantiation and the, and the destruction of virtual machines as and, as and when they're required. So uh, how does this work now? Well, uh, basically, the user submits the job just like they did before. There's no change in the workflow. But in this case, Cloud Scheduler is checking the queue uh, periodically, once every minute or so. And then uh, seeing the queue and there are no virtual machines to run the jobs on, it uh, talks to a cloud that it selects. It picks them on some algorithm, either round robin. There are several algorithms you can use. And uh, it starts a virtual machine there. And then the virtual machine registers with the Condor queue. Condor sees a resource that it can run the jobs on, and it dispatches the jobs uh, to that cloud. And this continues. On all the time. So the cl cloud scheduler continues to watch the queue, and it's uh, continually to drain the queue. Uh, eventually, uh, there are more resources on the cloud than there are jobs to run. And so you reach the situation where you have, you're wasting resources to keep the virtual machines running. So cloud scheduler is continually checking the queue. It sees that there are no jobs to run. It talks to the cloud and says, OK, shut everything down. So, and eventually, we end up with the resources available for another workload. So that's how we uh, run uh, the, the batch uh, work through with the high throughput computing. But we also need some other uh, facilities to help us do that. So for example, we need to distribute software to these various machines that are scattered all around the world. And so we, we actually use uh, CERN VM file system, which is a read-only HTTP file system together with squid caches and a little piece of software called Shoal that we wrote again to do dynamic squid uh, uh, discovery because these things are, could be running anywhere. And basically, that, those will allow us to efficiently uh, retrieve the data from the nearest source, those three components. Um, the, next, uh, the next thing that we have is a, a data distribution, and we're using um, uh, the, the standard uh, distribution of Atlas data, which is uh, distributed around the world anyway. And then w uh, this piece of software called UGR, or Unified Generic Redirector, to actually uh, find the, the closest um, uh, source of the data via GOIP. And then it's uh, a, an HTTP protocol, uh, and again, it's read-only. Also, we don't submit jobs manually, OK? Obviously, we don't submit 1.2 jobs with one man pressing the submit key. We actually tie these into the high energy physics um, uh, job management queues. In the case of Atlas, it's called Panda. In the case of Bell 2, it's called Dirac. But what about image distribution, which is what we're supposed to be talking about here? So let's get back to uh, image distribution. Well, just to give you a little bit of history, when we started in 2006, we started off with Globus Workspaces and Nimbus, as it was at the time. And Nimbus had the advantage that it could retrieve um, uh, images re from remote sources and instantiate those. So we actually out, out, um, wrote a, uh, uh, um, an image repository manager called Repoman. And Repoman had the advantage of being able to uh, make public images available through HTTP and private images available through authenticated users. Uh, through HTTPS, and we used uh, X509 authentication to do that. But um, when all the, stack, all the clouds have basically become an open stack clouds or some variant of that, and these clouds require the images to be uh, uh, saved locally in, within the cloud, within the Glance repositories. And so uh, at that point, Repoman basically doesn't work for us anymore. And so we needed to have something else do that for us. So, um, this situation with uh, automatic instantiation and, uh, and uh, you know the distribution of jobs and so on was man you know and, was, and images was manageable when we had a few clouds uh, basically in North America, but when we had this map which we showed you earlier, um, you know that starts to get very error prone, very time consuming. It really isn't uh, man manageable man uh, manually anymore. So uh, we uh, came up with another solution. Basically, um, we needed something to solve that problem, to distribute the images. And uh, we needed something running so that we could do that. Uh, we looked around. We found this blueprint. Okay, this was actually, uh, I think, inspired by John Bresnahan. He, uh, he wrote this blueprint. Uh, unfortunately, this blueprint was abandoned at the beginning of 2014. And uh, so we looked at Staccato, which was also like a, an incubator project of John Bresnahan, and it, it, it kind, of, kind of stalled as well. So we, they still, we didn't have a solution here, but we know, knew what we want, uh, wanted. 
Uh, these are the uh, design objectives that we had. Uh, there are a few there that I want to just uh, pick up on. First of all, we don't like to rewrite code that works very well in the first place. So we think Keystone works great. We didn't want to have our own identity solo. Uh, we think Glance works great. We didn't want to rewrite how Glance works. We basically wanted to use the services that they provided and just write the glue that made did the bits that we wanted uh, to, to do. The second thing is that we have um, you know, a problem with instantiating by IDs and AMIs and things like that because we have different AMIs and new UIDs to the same image in 25 different places. And then you have to be able to say, I want this image and I want that image, and it, it starts to get very confusing. So we wanted to um, instantiate and distribute by name. And uh, basically, we thought, well, Users have complete control over the names. They can decide to, to upload an image called name A, and they can upload a second image called name A. We don't like you to do that, but that's what you can do. So, it doesn't, so you have complete control over the names. You can rename them, uh, you can delete them, and so on. So um, we, that was a, an important dis uh, design consideration for us. Next thing we wanted, of course, was a pluggable architecture because originally we were dealing with multiple cloud types as we are today, actually. We're still de dealing with uh, uh, Amazon EC2, we're still dealing with GCE, we're still doing OpenStack, and we still have a couple of Nimbus clouds out there. So we wanted a pluggable architecture so we could actually support those clouds and write the support in for that. Um, I'm going on from there. So uh, the, we actually uh, ended up with four components, um, and uh, the, the, we have the the Glint service itself, which is the piece that actually does the distribution. We have the Glint Horizon, which is our modifications to the Horizon dashboard, which is our current user interface to the service. Um, we uh, have Glint service, which is basically just a collection of installation scripts in order to get Glint installed, and there are a variety of ways in which you can install it. And we have a backup utility, and I have just one slide on the backup utility later on, so we'll talk about that later. OK, just a quick review of what uh, about Glance, because Glint uses Glance. And uh, the important thing uh, that we want to say about that is that Glance is really both metadata, images, and services, right? So uh, those are three components, and we use all of those. Uh, the important thing about this slide is that the metadata, there's one table within the metadata called images, and it actually uh, has um, the, it actually has the attribute of the property of the owner. So basically, if you look at the, the uh, back-end storage, it's got a bunch of images, and you can tell who the owners are. And that's quite an important thing for us. And uh, the way this works is that a user logs into the Horizon dashboard with the username and password. They talk to the identity server. They get a token from the identity server that sort of identifies who they are when they go and ask for other services. And so they can talk to Glance and get back the list of images or the images that uh, they actually ha have authority to access. OK, likewise, um, Glint has its own metadata, and it has uh, a cache, but uh, we'll talk about that. So Glint has uh, three main tables that it uh, has. First of all, it has the repositories table. And the repositories table basically just points to identity servers uh, uh, on the remote repositories or the remote clouds that you want to actually distribute images to. Okay, the second table it has is a credentials table. So this is just basically the credential, your credentials, okay, how you would log into that remote service. So it basically identifies, um, it identifies a tenant on the remote cloud, one credential, one tenant on one remote cloud. And it effectively links the current tenant on the local cloud to a remote tenant on a remote cloud. Okay, so that's what that's the credentials does. The third table it has is a state table or a dynamic table, which basically tracks the user session and uh, keeps track of tokens that, it that it, it's needed to access the other clouds. So how does this work? Well, in this case, the, Im uh, the uh, user would ask for images to be copied or removed. And the first thing that happens is that the Glint service would then use your credentials, and it would go out and get tokens from all the clouds that you've just specified tokens for. It then uh, calls the Glance service and says, tell me which images you have for that user. Okay, and so it can compile a matrix of where all the images are, okay, and in fact, where it, the source of the images that it's going to copy would come from. The next thing it would do is it would pick a source and it would stage 
the, uh, the image into its cache. And after that, it's fairly simple for it to replicate that out to the other sources. So it can actually copy from a remote site to a local, from a local to a remote, from remote to remote, and do all those combinations. Okay. So this is what it looks like from the, uh, from the user's point of view. Uh, these are screenshots. I hope you can read the screenshots. It was really hard to get it so it was clear, but I hope you can read them. So the uh, login looks pretty much the same. We branded it a little bit to show you it's, it's Glint uh, enabled, if you like. And uh, so they would log into that. And the first thing they would be confronted with is a pretty standard overview uh, page. There's not much changes there. The only changes we've made are to the images tab on the, uh, on the dashboard. If we go to the images tab, this looks pretty much like a standard images tab. And the important thing there is that we've actually created three sub-tabs on that page. And the, the local images is basically the same as the standard images page that you would see. All the real work goes into the other two tabs. Okay, so we're going to spend most of our time on those other two tabs. And we're going to follow this workflow. We're going to distribute some images. And the first thing would be to select um, the local tenant, because basically we're going to connect the local tenant to remote tenants, as we described it earlier. The next thing we're going to do is we need to add repositories. We need to say where, the, where we want to push these things. And then we need to give it our credentials, and then we can go through the process of distributing images. OK, so the uh, selection of the local tenant is done with this standard uh, drop-down box. We just can pick it. And we, you can see we're currently on the Bell 2 project, and we can select the Atlas project, which we'll do. And then we'll select the uh, Remote Repositories tab. And when we do that, we can see we actually have no uh, defined repositories. But we do have a, an action button which says that we can add repositories. So we'll go ahead and do that, and we get the Add Repositories dialog. At this point, we have to fill. It. We have. We can provide three mandatory fields and one optional. The uh, the first is the name. This is a short name by which the cloud will be referred to from here on after. The next is the identity service URL of the cloud that we want to talk to. And the easiest way to get that is actually to log into that cloud and go into the Access and Security tab and actually uh, grab it from the identity source right there. And we can paste that right into the, into the uh, dialog. And then uh, the format is a mandatory field. But right now, we only have one value because we've only written the support for the OpenStack cloud. So that's the default. And the description is optional. So we can just hit the Enter key on that. And we'll come back to the Repositories tab. And you can see now we have a repository. And um, we're given a couple of actions associated with that. We can, we can delete the repository, or we can add credentials to it. And probably that's what we want to do. So we'll go ahead and add the credentials. And again, we have uh, just three mandatory fields. There's the tenant, the username, and the password for that. And you need to provide all three of those in order to access the cloud. Okay, so I've taken the liberty here of adding two other repositories, just to show you. Uh, if you look at this screen, it does indicate one other thing, and that is that of the three repositories, I've only added credentials to two of them. There's one repository without credentials, and we'll come back to why I've done that later on. OK, so I can go to the, uh, the image distribution page now. And what I have is a matrix. And the first column of the matrix shows you the list of images that are available for distribution. Uh, but the other three columns are actually the repositories where the these images are actually uh, uh, residing right now. Uh, the first column is always the local repository. So in this case, our local repository is RAT01, and the tenant is Atlas. Okay? On the, uh, the other two are the remote repositories that we added. So we're going to an Alto and a mouse cloud. And, uh, one, and you'll notice that the tenant names on the remote cloud do not have to match the tenants on the local cloud. You can move them between tenants. Okay? They're, they're linked by the credentials. And as you can see, all the images are currently located on mouse. Now, the way you distribute things is you just change the checkboxes. You, you toggle the checkboxes. And so uh, if we go ahead and do that, you can see that we got some pending um, uh, images now. And uh, basically, we're saying we want to copy those the two images from mouse to both uh, RAT and Alto. And we hit the Save button to do that. And it will show us a progression bar that uh, that, the, uh, that it's happening. And obviously, it takes time, because you're actually moving data across the network. 
Okay, but when it's finished, it'll give you the matrix and it'll be updated with where the images actually are. Okay, so we've, we've done that. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch back to the project that we came in on, or the tenant we came in on, which is the Bell 2 one. And I'm just going to show you the repositories page again, so the image distribution page again. And you can see we don't have much on it, okay, because uh, first of all, um, we have no local images, all right, so there are none, no images listed. And there are no local re uh, remote repositories listed because uh, we haven't had any had we haven't ha uh, added any credentials for this local tenant to remote repositories, and so uh, we'll go back to that page. And as you can see, uh, all three repositories which are available um, to this tenant, okay, uh, uh, need credentials added. Um, basically, when you add a repository in the system, it's, av it's, it's publicly available to all tenants on the cloud, on the local cloud. Okay? And the idea is it's just a, a URL pointer, basically. And uh, it's your credentials that are, are private to one tenant. Okay? So, um, so in this option, we have, uh, if you look at the actions, you'll see that the first and last actually only have the add credentials options. The middle one, which doesn't have any credentials, would actually allow you to delete it because other it's currently redundant. But it, we'll go ahead and add all the uh, credentials. And then we'll take a look at the uh, distribution page. And as you can see, uh, we have now four clouds listed. We have the three remotes and the local. The local is uh, always the second column. Okay? And the only other thing I want to point out here is that you can actually make multiple selections at a time. Last time, we just showed two copies. But in this case, what we're doing is we're doing copies um, down here, but the, up here we're actually, d sorry, I'm just moving the mouse, we're doing an actual delete. We've got uncheck the box, and it will actually do that when we hit the save key. Take that out of the way. So uh, I said I had one slide about the backup facility. We did a lot of movements of images, and we didn't have a good way of backing up the repository. I don't know whether anybody else has had that problem, but one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to back up both images and the metadata. Okay, And uh, we just wanted to have a local directory. It was either NFS mounted, or it could be a network file system of some kind. And we just wanted to be able to have a local directory mounted there that we could back up the images to. And so this takes incremental backups. It creates a, a version backup for each time there's a changes. If there's nothing to do, it tells you there's nothing to do, and it doesn't take another backup. Okay. Um, all right, so that's the backup facility. We have uh, four links that I want to give to you. Uh, the first three are the, the sources of all the Glint code. So the first one is actually the Glint service. It contains the backup utility as well. And the second one is the Horizon updates dashboard updates. The third one is our Glint service. That's all the installation codes. Um, and the last one is our team website. So you can see we have the documents and presentations and various other reports. You can see who the personnel is on the team and uh, has that. You might find that interesting. OK, um, we are not finished. We've got things that we want to do to it. And one of the things we'd like is a command line interface. So uh, all our code is on GitHub. It's all open source and available. You can download it, play with it, try, you know, uh, modify it. And, uh, but basically, we, we, uh, when we have a problem, we open up an issue on GitHub. We just, uh, and th in this case, we actually documented the, the kind of syntax that we wanted to see in the command line interface. And this, is, this problem is one of our high priorities to, to, to address. OK, you can try it. 20 minutes, you can have it running. OK, so there's the five-step process. It'll tell you how to get it going. And uh, you follow this, and it's going to use those, those URLs that I gave you, the first three, and it will get it running for you. OK, so in summary, OK, um, we continue to develop Glint. Uh, we believe it has applicability to other users. We know other users are very interested in using it, like Compute Canada I know is interested in using it. I believe CERN is interested in using it. Anybody who's using lots of clouds and has images to move is probably going to be interested. And uh, we would like to see Glint incorporated into OpenStack as a project. Now, to be honest, we didn't go around the uh, standard process of how we've d learned today that we should have developed an OpenStack project. Because originally, when we started, we were just creating a standalone utility. But now, uh, you know, we eventually evolved into, hey, we should really incorporate this into the dashboard and make it very easy. So we would like to see it adopted. We're going to be trying to talk to the people, you know, the Glance PTL, the Glance development team, and see if we can get it involved in there. 
And um, the last bullet there is I'd like to acknowledge our, basically the people who fund us. So the, uh, the people there is University of Victoria, obviously. Uh, the IPP is the Institute of Particle Physics of Canada. Um, our PI is a member of that uh, organization. Canary is the uh, National Research Network uh, provider. And uh, NSERC is a major uh, science and engineering funding agency of Canada. So, so with that, I'm going to just give you my e email. If you'd like to email me, uh, that's available for you too. Are there any questions? Sir? I'm sorry. It's very hard to hear with the background. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Um, to be honest, we haven't played with Swift a lot because we have very small systems that we're developing on. I would think that you could use Swift as a back end to glance and this would all still work. Okay. I mean, basically, we've, we, all our testing has been with the file system back end. But uh, basically, you can use a variety of back ends with glance and then we're, then we're just using glance, download, upload, keystone authentications. The idea would be that the advantage is that the Swift would do itself the synchronization of the uh, image while you will need to work on the metadata and, uh, among the glance without working on the... On remote clouds that, that yeah. you are not the administrative you know, domain outside your administrative... Okay, yes, if these are out of the administrative domain, of okay, course Okay, that, that, yeah. that is a problem there, right? I mean, yeah. basically, we're using other people's clouds, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, no, maybe so also was thinking to you, how can you use this kind of things in a multi-region environment and... I'm sorry, I didn't get it again. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking that this could be also very useful in a multi-region environment without, let's say, the need of cross-border yes. uh, domain solution, okay. Okay, no, I, I think you're right. Sir? Um, I have a simple question. Uh, how hard is to integrate that with a uh, glance? So when, for example, you have someone that is asking for a virtual machine and an image, to be able, to, uh, glance to be able to look to foreign uh, URLs and other uh, repositories, and why you don't try to do that? Okay, uh, how hard is it to um, integrate it with Glance? Well, f first of all, it uses Glance. Uh, we don't, th I don't think we make a single Glance modification here. Um, basically, it's a, it's a service that runs beside Glance. It has its own endpoints, okay? Uh, but in the back end, what it's doing is basically doing, uh, getting a keystone token, either your local token, which it already has, okay, by the mere fact you get through to our endpoint, and then um, it's using the remote credential tokens that we retrieve, and then it's doing image download, image upload. Okay, so it's, it's, it's not introducing anything to Glance. Uh, the I hard thing is the, the modification of Horizon at this stage. In that case, we are actually taking the Horizon install and modifying um, the framework there in order to produce our screens. Uh, sorry, can I ask one more time? Certainly. Uh, I mean that right now, if you want an image, you have to go manually and select it. Please download this image I want in this specific yes. cloud. Uh, how hard is actually to just keep it everything in glints and when someone from the from one of the clouds asks for the image to we'll be able to integrate the glints with the glints to ask okay is this I don't have the image on okay. glints but maybe there is in glints so go fetch for me okay so I, as I understand it what you're asking is how easy would it be to script the um, the distribution of images basically automatically. And I think the answer is with, uh, with the way it is right now and everything through the dashboard, it wouldn't be easy. But that's one of the reasons why we want to write the command line interface. Because basically, we w if, if you look at the structure of the command on, that, on those slides, and I think you'll have access to the slides, um, you'll see that, that uh, effectively, um, it will, you can say, list the images, and you'll get the matrix. Okay? And then you can just say, these images on these clouds, and they should go, right? So basically, you could cron that, or you could run, a, run some procedure automatically to do that. So I think it would be easy with the command line interface. Okay, sorry, you had a question. 
Um, firstly, thanks. Very interesting talk. Um, certainly, as an ex-physicist, uh, yeah. um, very interesting talk. Okay. Um, as an ex-physicist and, and a glance core, I feel it was tailor-made for me. Um, I think just in, in some of the newer um, code bases, there's things in glance such as image cloning. I'm, I'm sorry. It's, it's just there's a lot of background noise. Okay. I'm very sorry. In, in the current glance code, there's a lot of um, <laughs> there's new stuff around image cloning. It just might be worth kind of having a chat about. Yes. The might be some overlap. Okay, so, so the, the, uh, the comment is about image cloning. Okay, so um, yeah, basically it does clone images from one place to another, uh, it, either from remote to local, local to remote, remote to remote. Okay, it could do all this. Within the same region, that's functionality now that's being added to Glance. So it's yes. really much useful to explore, you know. How, yes, so yeah. basically by using the services of Glance, we think there are any improvements in Glance in this area, like doing it, we're going to get the benefit of that, okay? So we'll get efficiencies from doing that. Right now, um, there is, you know, um, there is some delay in lo uploading images. We do, th we do thread it all, so if you actually copy one image to multiple places, you will actually get, um, you know, it'll actually go through in parallel. It doesn't happen uh, serially. So you do, it is actually quite performance at the moment. Yes, sir. I should give you the microphone and you can try. What size images have you been working with? Oh, uh, size of images. Well, actual fact, um, we have been trying to reduce image sizes, okay, because uh, up until a few years ago, our image sizes were typically 10 gigs, okay, and uh, we even had them as big as 20 gigs, all right. Um, nowadays, we're actually uh, we're using something called uh, CERN VM3. Okay, which is a microkernel VM, and it's basically a few megabytes. So this distribution happens very quickly. Okay, so uh, but uh, it it works with big images. It just takes a long time. I mean that's one reason why we didn't do a live demo because you don't want to be sitting there tapping your foot while it happens, right? But uh, with with micro VMs. Uh, literally, images get trans and, and also we're, most of the images are going out across the world or acro right across Canada. That's the you know the best part of three or four thousand miles. Um, you know uh, those those images go across within you know 20 seconds typically. They're, I mean they're, they're, it's pretty fast for the microkernel VMs. Sir, uh, can I give this gentleman? So it looked like that uh, you had to do the. Uh, transfer big you have to uh, do this tenant by tenant is that true or you okay. could do it at the if I, okay so let me just uh, clarify the tenants uh, basically um, you have you have the credentials for your local cloud right and you have credentials for every cloud that you get uh, that you borrow from somebody else like we borrow probably like uh, 20 25 clouds okay and we got credentials for every one of those clouds Okay, so basically, um, you know the credentials for your local cloud. When you log in, you add repositories. Every tenant on your local cloud gets to see those repositories, but not every tenant can use them until they can actually add their own credentials for those clouds. Okay, and then and then they become av available on your image distribution page. Does that make sense? Yeah, so every tenant has to be replicated on clouds also. Well. Well, for, for example, if you looked at some of those clouds there that we were showing, we actually only had one tenant on, on the remote cloud, but we were actually propagating it to two tenants on the local cloud. So it, it's, a, it's not a one-for-one -one match. It's whatever you need it to be, actually, if that makes sense. Okay? Sorry, there's a question here. Uh, did you try image compression? Image compression. Um, we haven't. To be honest, we haven't tried it. Because I'm, I'm having a talk on Wednesday. Yeah. Because I'm giving a talk on Wednesday, and we have pretty much similar uh, needs because we also have uh, issues with distributing. I'm so for certain. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cheat. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we have a very similar case, but we don't care about uh, multiple uh, clouds. We, don't, we only care about one specific cloud and okay. how fast we can distribute the image. And I'm going to give some examples of for compre only by compressing the image, you have like 60 to 70 percent more speed up. Okay. So, are you planning? Are you going to contribute? Sorry. You, the images are raw images. Right? Uh, depends. Sometimes, uh, yeah, sometimes there are just ISOs. Or, uh, I don't really know. We just compress it by default because the user can arbitrarily. 
So the discussion is about raw images versus compressed images, <laughs> okay, that's going on here. Okay. Um, anyway, if you're contributing that to Glance, then I think we're going to benefit, all right? <laughs> okay, because that's the way we want to be. We don't want to write any code that is, you know, being done. In fact, um, the deletion, we don't even allow you to delete from the local repository through our page because, hey, you get it through the default page, right? And so we don't even, we don't even replicate that functionality. You have to go to the default page to do that, okay? Anybody else? Yes, sir, over here. Uh, hello. So you have a couple of sites, right? A couple of regions. So uh, how many images do you have uh, now? Five, seven? Um, how, 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 okay, uh, sorry. This is how many this images? We have, yeah. I know that we have at least 15 images on the cloud in Alberta, okay? I think we have somewhere around about 20 something images on the cloud in Victoria. And uh, we have other clouds around. So there, there's probably somewhere in the region about 35 images. And they, they go through quite a bit of um, churn, especially the older images do. We've been trying to standardize the images as much as we can, get them smaller, and do a lot more of the software distribution through CERN VMFS. Okay? So we are actually narrowing the number of images we need to manage, and they're much easier to move around than they used to be. Okay? But we still have anywhere up to about 40 images that we're floating around right now. Yeah, because, you know, uh, we consider to building daily, let's say, images, because there is a couple of env environments, you know, the kernel updates, stuff like that, yeah. uh, everything should be up to date. And there will be a problem because when we will build the daily images, we will have uh, at the end of the month at least 30 of them. And then the name will be problematic. Uh, I, I just wonder if you deal with that kind of problem because you, since you are replicating, you, it seems that the images are important to you guys. Okay, so when we replicate, we will replicate to the other repository, the destination repositories, uh, as the same name as they came out. So whatever name they had at the first, they will have it on the new repository. If, if there are name conflicts, that's an issue that we want to deal with. We want to say that's, not, that's an error, actually. We want to highlight that and say, correct this. We currently don't do that because we, we're careful to name our images, but we'd like it to actually sort of flag that as an error, okay, and give you the ability to change it easily. Okay, um, as far as building images dynamically as opposed to having uh, special copies, in our field, typically uh, the image, it, it, like the, the level of software that we need is specific and we don't want uh, compiler updates happening or, um, uh, you know, like application changes coming in because uh, if, you do the, if you do the same calculation using different versions of the compiler, you can get different results and then the science goes wrong. So typically we don't want dynamic loads there, dynamic images. Okay, do okay. you agree with that? Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Is there any, oh yes, sir. In your presentation you talked about uh, it's kind of net new um, image distribution to remote sites, right? So yes. what if you're updating an image and you want to redistribute that to remote sites? Okay, so... Um, Is that handled at all? Okay, so if you're updating, like the image is being updated and then you want to distribute it while it's being updated? I well, don't after it's updated. After it's updated? Oh, well, if it's okay. So, so basically, you have, you have to uncheck and we, then change recheck, this, we change this image and you want to update. Actually, let me tell you about the backup facility. The reason why we included the backup facility here was because there was a thought that the Im local image repository changes take a backup. Okay? And we know when that happens because we're doing the change. Okay? Um, in the end, we decided just to make it a standalone utility right? because. Um, sometimes image changes happen uh, other than through, the, through Glint, right? So we didn't do it that way. But the, the thought comes to mind is here is an example where, hey, I changed this image here, I want it propagated. And I think that that would be a possibility to do that. Um, basically, we, we, uh, our key as to what an image really is, what, you know, like it's not the name, it's not the UUID, the key is the checksum, okay? The checksums are the same. That's, that's the same image, right? And so uh, basically, uh, you know, if we saw that an image A, you know, used to have this checksum, but now it's got a different checksum, 
I mean, we could, we could automate a, uh, a change on that or a propagation on that basis. So, I, I mean, I think it's possible. We don't do anything yet, but I think it's very possible to do. Because that's the only way you can then cron it, I guess, then. Well, you could cron it, but we could, you know, the service is running all the time, okay? And so, theoretically, we could put in a process to go around and check the images for you. We could do that. I think it's possible. You know, we have to see whether, you know, that's something people really want. Oh, there's a question over here. Thank you. Uh, so, I want to um, clear about that. Uh, if the image is need uh, uh, synchronized to each tenant, so each tenant needed to do that, or your image uh, is single or distributed by, uh, by the admin credential, then it's shared to all the tenant. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing because of the thing. So, what I understand you're saying is, do, I need, do you need to go into manually distribute it, okay, or can uh, that happen automatically? No, no, I mean, uh, so, if you distribute it with the admin credential or mm -hmm. the user credential? Okay, the images are always um, moved from to any destination using your credentials. Okay, so that means uh, if you, you have the multiple tenants um, on the other cloud, then you need to synchronize or distribute it to each tenant. Basically, um, if you, if you want to move uh, an image from cloud A to cloud B, yeah. you have to have credentials on both of them. Okay? okay. All right? And normally, uh, you would have to enter the credentials one, download, you have multiple tenants on that cloud, right. you distribute it once, and then you guys glance, member, add, and share the images with all the other tenants. Okay, good. Yeah, you that show up on your uh, images shared with yeah. me. But it's not on Am the, I done? On the two, yeah, that's uh, it's okay. manually. Oh, that's a feature you, you, could, you could add. Uh, yeah, you are yeah. right. Okay. So, gentlemen, I, I've just been told we're out of time and we have to stop. Thank you very much for coming and listening to us. Yeah, that's uh, very much appreciated. Could I get a copy of your presentation? Certainly, you can.